Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. In this video, we're gonna do a few odd jobs around the garden. We're prepping for mulch and several other things about uh, paint a foundation. Uh, we've got the colors picked out for that. And then we're gonna be able to do some foundation work. We've got a big giant pile of wood chips we're working on moving out here for the garden paths. We're in the process of tearing the fences down in the back garden and you know on two sides and the wooden fence that I've talked about since we started this project four years ago is actually going to be under construction very soon. Uh, so those again those fences are coming out, wood chips are going down, it's just big projects uh, right this minute. There's a, some other detail things we need to do in here at the same time. You know you can't um, overlook the little you know the little little pruning things that need to be done here uh, while we're trying to tackle a giant mountain of wood chips over there on the uh, on the driveway we have found that these wood chips do a fantastic job well they do uh, lots of things and there's an entire videos on the channel for why wood chips are so amazing uh, but they're great at building soil but the second use for them that we have found is these paths out here in the garden they're fantastic for making garden paths out of uh, we've we've done it for a while over at Juniper Level Botanic Garden uh, at uh, Plant Delights Nursery. Uh, they use them as their garden paths as well. They're really nice to walk on, and they seem to protect the soil underneath them quite a bit. You can as you're walking on them, there's a sponginess there that never really compacts down. Uh, and so no matter what kind of foot traffic we've put on our garden paths back there, they continue to feel, you know, kind of like we're not we're not really compacting the soil underneath them they also break down in time and of course they're feeding i'm sure roots from the all the plants that are here along these garden paths are rooting in up underneath it and taking advantage of the uh of the uh all the uh, nutrients that are in this material as beneficial bacteria beneficial fungi are breaking it down it's just a great material the other thing is it allows us to elevate the paths because this material is well, we got it for free from chip drop uh, because it's free, I don't mind going in there and putting six or eight inches in these garden paths at the time. And it elevates the garden paths above the bed. And so when we're getting rain, uh, the water is not settling into our paths. So our paths stay walkable in, even after it's rained. And also I think that m the water is making it out into the, more into the beds and not in my paths. If, pa if you just walk your paths down forever, you'll notice they kind of sink, you know, over, over time. And then you know, when it rains, that's where the water goes, you know, and not into your, uh, down into your garden bed. So we, anyway, it's a great, it's a great material. Um, we were, there's a little bit of hemlock in it this time. I always like to try to identify some of the trees uh, that are in it. We got lucky here in our neighborhood. We're pretty fortunate that this is a, a 90, 80 year old neighborhood and in an 80 year old neighborhood there's so many trees we also have above ground power lines so they're constantly aggressively pruning trees back in here and so anytime we put our name on chip drop we get it pretty quick in newer areas newer subdivisions new areas being constructed it's probably not as available just uh but there's tree we we shoot these videos very early in the morning because we know the chainsaws and blowers and all the other things, all the other equipment that um, do the tree work in here will be uh, running all day long. We've got to do, this path on this side is the narrowest path uh, that we have. And it's almost gotten to the point of being too, too narrow. We may have to move a couple of things around uh, ultimately. I also like the color differentiation. Right now it's just leaves in the beds here, but it's about to be triple shredded hardwood mulch. And that brown color against this lighter color uh, wood material, it's the bark of the hardwood tree is the darker material. And then this is the inside of the tree, really, the uh, inside of the limbs. And just that lighter coloration looks great. But again, even now, even now, it's easy, you know, just, it's, it's great to walk on. Dogs seem to like it. Good material for this operation and has the added bonus of looking good as well.
I've put up a couple pruning videos already, one on uh, some evergreen things out here in the garden that bloom in the summer or we don't rely on for flowers, and then one on some of the uh, summer flowering deciduous plants that are out here, Caryopteris and Clethra, American Beautyberry and Hydrangea paniculatas. Uh, so those videos have already gone up. Uh, probably wait until after some of our early spring flowering things uh, that have the buds on them to do any additional major pruning videos at this point. I've got a Laura Petalum back there that needs real, real surgery and a few other things that bloom pretty early. But we've missed a couple things at this point. Uh, this is an epimedium uh, and it's off color right now, but we're a week or two away from this thing having flowers on it. I'm almost as warm as it's been, almost surprised I'm not seeing any uh, in here. But any of your ground cover things you can go and assess right now. We're looking at, you know, cast iron plants, not necessarily a ground cover. It's more of a spiky plant, but I'm cleaning those up. Uh, we're going to move from this to a St. John's wort in just a second that I can prune back. If you've got any uh, liriope that hasn't been pruned back yet, you can do that. Uh, you can judge your carexes just based on the way they came out of the season as to whether or not you um, would cut them back or not. If they look pretty good, you can just leave them, leave them be. But there are some of these ground covers uh, it's probably good to go in and prune out any dead material in them and just in general clean them up, make them ready for the uh, season. With this epimedium, I'm just going to give it a haircut, uh, some of this brown leaf material off the top of it. This is a great shade uh, ground cover, although there are uh, species and named varieties. I've got some bulbs coming up in the middle of it like everything else in this, uh, in this garden, so I'll be careful with the be careful with that but just like so they're not all ground covers that's what i was about to say the epimediums might there's some that get quite tall in the garden uh, they're great plants and they get these really intricate interesting flowers on them uh, in a few weeks and they stand out just on top of the very low plant and if i don't prune it back They'll just kind of sit right on the top. You won't see it very well. But by doing what I just did, and I can just leave this material here. I'm going to mulch over it here in the next week or so. But by doing what I just did, these flowers will stick up big and tall above it. And then new foliage will come. And the new foliage looks great all season long. It's not until the dead of the winter that it turns this kind of that kind of color. Remember when I said I almost waited too long? Well, on this one, I kind of have. You see these amazing flowers. They haven't all started to open, but they're really complex tiny little flowers that open in these clusters. They'll get taller as it comes up, but uh, I still have a little bit of time here to take the very top of this kind of tattered foliage off of it before uh, that comes up through it. But there are tons of flowers in here. You see it, it's gonna be flowering for a while and I'm not causing it any problem by, as long as I'm careful here, not to uh, cut any of those off. Also, a little, I'll allow a little light down there. It may help those flowers get going a little faster here. Right at the very beginning of when this uh, project started, I tore the chain link fence down that was in the uh, back. Uh, I don't even know if I'll be able to find the footage. And then we put a piece of chicken wire basically across the top of it to keep Griffin uh, from wandering out of the space while we were waiting to do the uh, rest of this. The other issue we have back there was just a ton of ivy uh, and other things coming from the uh, neighboring property. And what we've done back there is just put a little bit of wood chips, you know, just beyond, just beyond the property line back there, just a little bit, just to kind of give us a little bit of buffer from that stuff, you know, from all, I mean, it's just a far, literally a forest of ivy trying to creep in on us back there. It just gives us a little defensible uh, space, uh, but that chicken wire is now down and it's ready. And then this morning I've taken down uh, this side uh, this is going. This, uh, this side over here is going to be a horizontal wood fence, probably about this tall. I don't want to feel like we're trapped in here. I mean, this is a nice, actually a nice space over here to the side of us. Uh, and there'll be some space between the boards on the top two or three boards here, and then there'll be more solid down at the bottom. The back side will be a bit taller uh, than this side. Uh, there, we're leaving the chain link fence between us and the neighbor. I actually don't know who owns it. I don't know if they put it up or, you know, I don't know if this fence was added onto their fence or their fence was added on to this fence. You know, it probably happened, it happened a long time ago. These are not new, you know, these are not new chain link fences. But there, nice thing is though, there is some damage on that side on the neighbor's adjoining piece. And so I'm able to salvage some pieces from over here to actually get that piece looking, you know, new, 
new-ish, <laughs> not new, but new-ish. Uh, so that side, and that side we have screening plants from one end to the other. So it'll be, you know, that we're not even gonna be able to see that fence here in the next uh, year, another year or so, it's just gonna disappear into the background anyway. But this side we're keeping open and the main reason we have to keep it open, where stuff is filming from is our vegetable garden. And you know, we, I don't want anything over here that blocks the sun. Uh, it's the only, only spot in the garden where the sun is on it, basically from nine in the morning until evening. Here's an example of the Carex I'm talking about. We're, I pruned these two back already. I'd rather not prune it. Um, and it's, there's, they're hardy in like zone five to nine. And we're in 8A, 7B, 8A here in Raleigh. And uh, normally they come out of winter looking pretty good. But for some reason, this one's got a lot of brown tips on it. And I think I'm just gonna go ahead and reset it. The main reason I'd rather not prune them is they're slower to come out. Like Liriope and other, some of our, uh, Gra real grasses. Carex is a grass-like plant, but it's just not a, not technically a grass. Uh, but grasses respond really well to being cut off. Liriope, uh, lots of other things. Car these some of these Carexes are a little slow to come back from it. But again, once they look kind of brown and tattered like this, it's probably just best to go ahead and uh, give them that haircut. This one's slightly ahead of those other two as well in size, but they're easy to cut back. Anytime you're cutting grasses, make sure your tools are pretty sharp because uh, we want to make sure that we're making just perfect cuts. Just like your lawnmower blade, you want to make sure your, you know, those little cuts you're making will be uh, brown and tattered if the tool you're using is not sharp. So uh, keep that in mind. But there you go. We'll just pull this out of here. Eventually, again, we're about to mulch inside of here. And that will come back out a little slower than other things might but it will be back and looking beautiful all season we have a couple st john's wort out here in the garden uh, one is out by the road underneath a couple of blueberries and i uh, pruned that one back already it's one that gets a little bit taller uh, these have these st john's wort uh, ground covers get uh, yellow flowers on them that are really intricate interesting flowers that the pollinators absolutely love the one out on the driveway is definitely a heavy flowering one. This Brigadoon is mostly grown for this kind of gold foliage and it's got a little bit of a reddish pink hue to the new growth as well as it's coming out in the spring. Really, really interesting plant. It gets a few flowers, but not a whole heck of a lot. Uh, it, it, it needs part shade here in our area. Most people watching can grow this and it needs part shade in our area and that's probably costing it a little bit of, a little bit of flowers. The only thing we have to do on this is as when at right at the end of winter i can actually if you have a big spot of this uh, st john's wort run the lawnmower over it if i wanted to uh, but it's a little small patch we maintain here so i just come over here and cut it back and you can already see down here at the bottom that it's uh, starting to uh, break dormancy and and come up and if it's gotten up into something that i don't want it in i can go ahead and uh, dig that out i could uh, divide some if I wanted to. A lot of these ground covers, uh, you know, you can cut away from the parent plant and transplant it to another area that's not filling in as fast as you want it to fill in. Uh, this is the time of year to be making all those kinds of decisions as things are breaking dormancy. Uh, I think there's a limit to how far this can run up under this lower petalum here uh, before it runs out of light. As low as you can cut it and then you can just take a rake a leaf rake and pull the material out if you want to uh, i will probably pull the leaf some of the leaves out of these ground covers right now we leave the leaves out here in the garden but this may end up keeping this too wet uh, so I'm, i'll grab a leaf rake and, and pull that out real quick i've talked many times about just leaving your leaves in place if you can unless you've got you know, they're piling up this deep and you got to just giant, giant trees causing, you know, massive amounts of leaves. But we just have one oak back here that's causing, it's dropping most of the leaves that are out here. It's a thin layer. They protected the soil during the winter and then we'll cover them up with mulch. Um, but a, a little cautionary tale on the leaves is your ground cover things don't necessarily like them all that much. So things like a juga that we have in the garden I'll go through after most of the leaves have fallen and just kind of rake them off the top of it so they don't sit on top of it covered up the whole winter. And then on 
Junipers would be out in more of a full sun area, but maybe they've had leaves and things blow in them during the winter time. Uh, your ground cover, things that grow really flat to the ground, and the St. John's wort's an example of that. It may like moist conditions, but it won't like the really wet conditions that'll be created by these leaves rotting within them and, and other mulches and things. So I will go through here and just gently pull it off and also find the pieces that I haven't cut yet at the same time. Uh, I'm not gonna pull every leaf out of here, but I'm just gonna make sure that there's not four inches of leaves sitting down in the bottom of them that will just keep it too wet uh, during the growing season. And I can just, these can go, you know, right up under this, you know, the shrub behind it and then in a thin layer, just like that. The little temporary chicken wire fence uh, has been right about here. And again, it just came, we, we took it down and then the new fence is actually, you know, the property line's actually way back here. So there's three or four feet to be gained in this process. There's a camellia that's been in holding basically right there that will end up, you know, coming back here, you know, in the space that we've gained. And then the order of things will make much more sense when we can move a couple of things actually where they're going. This magnolia uh, that's on the neighboring property has, I've limbed it up once, uh, but it still has some low hanging limbs here that are gonna be in the way of the, the fence will be about this tall, um, right about here. And so, you know, all of these limbs, I don't want all these limbs hanging over top of it. Magnolia is beautiful. Uh, it's a native and um, definitely wanna hold on to it. And I don't mind if the limbs come down a little bit in front of the fence in the future, but they can't be right on top of it while I'm trying to construct it. So this is another little project to do here is taking some weight off of this. Most of this will lift up just by uh, taking some weight off of it. This thing has been super happy back here. We put some wood chips down a couple times uh, back behind this fence and it's really built up the soil that we'll now be planting in. And this magnolia has been very, very happy because of it. We've got a few Smilax vines that are growing up into the trees up above them. We just keep cutting them down here at the bottom, but these bulbs are under the ground and they're big. Uh, they're really hard to dig completely out. It takes a long time to kill a Smilax once it really uh, takes over a space. Um, here's a... Uh, a sport, a little side sport of that magnolia. Another one coming up beside it. And now I've got thorns in my back from the Smilax. I'll cut them off down at the base. They'll come back up. I'll try to dig them out at some point. I think overall we've lifted that up. We can work under here now. And it'll, it'll have some more low branches, typical of a magnolia. They're hard to limb up into trees because they want to just keep coming down, keep coming down. Uh, but for now, that'll work. And I'll cut a little more of this Smilax vine out up higher so we can walk through here. There you go, beautiful. The St. John's wort got the full haircut. The Epimedium got a partial haircut. Uh, and this is another uh, one that'll get a, a, partial, a little bit of a partial haircut. Uh, the cast iron plants, uh, we will cut just selectively, uh, take out the leaves that have just become, become tattered and, and old. Uh, the, typically, you'll get about two years out of a leaf on one of these before they, uh, they, don't look particularly, uh, they don't look particularly great. And we'll just track them down in the plant and, and cut them off. And clean them up. If you find that it's more than half the plant, I can just hold the thing together and just go, to, go ahead and cut it all off. Uh, but this one's not, this one's got some leaves that were coming up right toward the end of the season that actually uh, look, still look pretty good. So I'm gonna leave them in place. I actually went and switched from pruners to a little pair of snips because it's just easier to get down in you know, a plant like this where I'm trying not to cut any new pieces that are you know, trying to come up. Uh, and uh, this is perfect size little snips for, for doing this exact job i used i always like a little pair of these sitting around somewhere this is what we actually use for propagation at the nursery 
because they were super, super inexpensive and we were doing thousands of cuts in a day. And that little spring is really, you can do thousands of cuts a day without, you know, your tan getting some hand fatigue. But, and occasionally I'll find something in the garden that's easy to cut and uh, they work well for that. Also, okay. All right, I'll get in here and get the rest of this cleaned up, but you get the general idea. Find the ones that look tattered and get them out of there and cut them all the way down to the ground, being careful not to cut the new material that's already coming up on them. So there's some of the, uh, the odd jobs that are going on in the garden. We have a ton of daffodils blooming. Daffodils are one of Steph's absolutely, absolute favorite flowers. First sign of spring, always kind of happy you know, showy little faces out here in the uh, garden this time of year. And we have, again, we have quite a few varieties. If you go back and look at any of the color blends uh, videos that we've done in the fall, the last three years or so, you can see a lot of the uh, varieties that we've added out here in the garden. Uh, color blends has a, uh, a Southern bulb um, page, uh, which is kind of helpful for making sure we're getting ones that will hold up here in the South. The little, video, uh, little photo montage you're about to see are the, some of the earlier blooming ones. We actually have quite a few. We, another thing we think about when we're, we're ordering bulbs and planting these daffodils is that we're getting early blooming ones, mid blooming ones, and late blooming ones. And you can see that on the uh, website as well. And so they don't all bloom out all at one time, unless of course you're mass planting them and you want them to all bloom out at the same time. But we kind of prefer that they're showing up as you know little drifts and spots of color out here in the garden lots and lots of different varieties so thank you guys so much for following along as you can see we are tackling some pretty major projects out here in the garden in spring of 2024 so please follow along and thanks for watching